Today we leave Florence and Flanders to travel to Rome. We're going to spend two days focusing on about 40 years and four artists, Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Titian. But first, let me give you some historical context. In the late 15th century, Pope Sixtus IV summoned artists to decorate the newly constructed Sistine Chapel. These artists included Botticelli, Girlandio, and Perugino, whose painting of Christ delivering the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter you see here. This painting is important for several reasons. I could imagine you being asked to identify its Renaissance elements. So what are they? The painting provides an excellent example of mathematical linear perspective shown especially clearly in the patterns of the square tiles. The painting lovingly replicates classical architectural features, although the building in the center is a fantasy temple, not an actual classical subject. Finally, the content or subject of the painting is especially appropriate for Renaissance Rome. Remember that the papacy had recently undergone some hard times. It was exiled to Avignon, then split between Avignon and Rome, where there were rival popes. So, popes returned to Rome were eager to reassert their leadership of the church and Rome's central place in the church and in culture. The imagery of Christ delivering the keys to St. Peter is all about reestablishing Rome as the center of the church and of European culture. While our story now moves beyond Florence, the man whose name became synonymous with the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, was nurtured in the Florence of the Medici. Leonardo was illegitimate, which meant he could not pursue a respectable career, such as banking or law. Instead, his father brought him to Florence in 1466, when he was 14, and apprenticed his son to a trade. The less than respectable trade that his father chose for his illegitimate son was art. Leonardo was apprenticed to one of the most successful artists of the day, Andrea di Cioni, otherwise known as Verrocchio. Other famous painters apprenticed or associated with the workshop included Girlandio, Perugino, and Botticelli. Verrocchio's workshop was the center of intellectual currents in Florence, and that helped assure that the young Leonardo received an education in the humanities. As an apprentice, Leonardo would have learned a wide range of skills, drafting, chemistry, metalworking, plaster casting, leatherworking, mechanics, and carpentry, as well as the artistic skills of drawing, painting, sculpting, and modeling. Again, remember that art at this time was viewed as a skilled trade, not as a learned profession. Here is Verrocchio's most famous painting, and what made it famous is that young Leonardo painted the angel on the left and touched up the background landscape as well. In his Lives of Eminent Painters, published in 1550, art historian Giorgio Vasari wrote, I quote, Verrocchio had already done the main work. Leonardo painted an angel who was holding some garments, and despite his youth, he executed it in such a manner that his angel was far better than the figures painted by Verrocchio. This was the reason why Andrea would never touch colors again. He was so ashamed that a boy understood their use better than he did. It's a great story. Too bad it's probably not true. But there are a couple of notable points about Leonardo's contribution to this painting. First, most of the work is painted in tempera or pigment mixed with egg. Leonardo's angel is painted in oil, and the landscape is overpainted in oil. The young Leonardo was experimenting with this promising new medium recently imported from the north. What other differences do you see between Leonardo's angel on the left and Verrocchio's angel on the right. Leon Leonardo's angel is paying close attention to the action. In contrast, Verrocchio's angel stares off into space <coughs> with no interest in what is going on. Indeed, he looks entirely bored. Verrocchio's angel looks more like an actual little boy. Leonardo's angel is beautiful in an otherworldly fashion. Above all, his use of oil paint allowed Leonardo to blend his paints more subtly, letting colors melt into each other without perceptible transitions. Leonardo later labeled this technique as fumato, or in the manner of smoke. After his apprenticeship with Verrocchio, Leonardo moved to Milan, where he spent the next 20 years as a court painter and military engineer and stage set designer and general errand boy to Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, a fearsome military leader and determined patron of the arts. In fact, Leonardo sold himself to the Duke primarily as a military engineer and just mentioned in passing that he painted better than anyone else. 
Here you see a self-portrait, an investigation of optics, and a design for a crossbow. Leonardo's multifaceted talents would make him the embodiment of a term we still use, Renaissance man, or as we might prefer now, Renaissance person. But alas, our time is limited, so we will focus on Leonardo as a painter and not as a scientist, inventor, or theorist. I'm going to make a gross oversimplification here, please forgive me, but when we looked at paintings of the early Italian Renaissance, the 1400s or 15th century, we saw two somewhat separate styles emerge. One was a highly mathematical style. Artists like Masaccio and Mantegna applied the rules of perspective to create optically accurate depictions of three-dimensional space. And then there was the poetical, even sentimental style represented by Botticelli and Fra Filippo Lippi. I still find it curious that the ECB chose only required works in this style to represent the early Italian Renaissance. Oh well. But in Leonardo, the mathematical and the poetical merge, and brilliantly. This painting, which is not one of our required works, offers an excellent illustration of this new synthesis. Note that the sweetly beautiful figures evoke Botticelli's goddesses and Madonnas, but the complex, precise composition echoes the mathematical brilliance of Masaccio or Mantegna. These diagrams help us see the geometry of the painting, how the multiple isos isosceles triangles draw our eye dynamically to the figure. Leonardo also takes chiaroscuro, or the contrast of light and dark, to new heights, in part because he's a master of the new medium of oil paint. I've already talked about sfumato. Even though he has masterful command of line, Leonardo deliberately blurs the boundaries of his figures, again, trying to capture how our eye perceives reality. We see Leonardo's explorations of the science of optics and his use of atmospheric perspective, imitating the way the eye sees more distant features as less distinct, paler, and bluer than objects in the foreground. Finally, and this is still another way that Leonardo combines poetry with precision, the painting makes the figures an integral part of their landscape and ties the figures to one another with gestures and with a pyramidal composition. This gives the painting a rare unity and coherence. The unity and coherence we'll see echoed in The Last Supper. This portrait of Ludovico Sforza's 15-year-old mistress may be my favorite Leonardo da Vinci painting. I actually find her expression even more intriguing than Mona Lisa's. What is she looking at? Is she resigned? Contented? And I'm not going to linger here either. We are so familiar with this painting that it's almost impossible to see it with new eyes. And it didn't make the list. But you recognize Leonardo's masterful use of chiaroscuro, sfumato, atmospheric perspective, and landscape, right? Okay, on to our required work. The Khan Academy podcast on this work is especially good, so don't skip it, okay? The Last Supper was a common theme in Renaissance art and a common decoration of the refectory or dining room of monasteries. It also posed a compositional challenge. How do you make a lineup of men sitting at a table interesting? It seems to me that Jill and Dio doesn't entirely succeed here. So how did Leonardo depart from the conventions shown in this early Renaissance painting, made, by the way, just 15 years earlier? Well, most notably, he puts Judas on Christ's side of the table. To Leonardo, betrayal is, in a way, just one more of the human reactions to Christ that he will explore. He also shows the disciples dynamically interrelating with a range of emotions as they respond to his statement that one of you will betray me. Leonardo spent hours wandering the streets of Milan, sketching faces, looking for the best possible model for each disciple. The Khan Academy homework did a good job of describing Leonardo's complex use of geometry and perspective in this painting. So I will move through the next few slides quickly and let the diagrams mostly substitute for the disembodied voice. Here we see that by grouping the disciples into threes, Leonardo gave the painting a dynamic rhythm that contrasts with Christ's stillness at the center of the painting. And of course, The Last Supper has become the textbook example of one-point linear perspective. But even more than mathematical genius, it is the emotional power of Leonardo's Last Supper that gained it lasting fame, an emotional power captured in movement, in gesture, and in interaction. 
Some of the figures are seated. Some are rising from their chairs. They are looking at, gesturing to, and talking with each other. They are gripped by the moment, and it shows in not only their faces, but their bodies. Again, with Christ as a still center, taking it all in. So, my apologies, this is a long clip, but it talks both about why the treatment of the content and the technique Leonardo employed were so revolutionary. Alas, the revolutionary technique of combining oil and temper did not stand the test of time. Behind the refractory wall was the monastery's hot, steamy kitchen, and underneath it was Milan's high water table. Less than two decades after its completion, the painting began to dissolve. And this is why what we see today is what one of the commentators in the video calls the ghost of a painting. After Leonardo's day, the story becomes even grimmer. When Napoleon's troops seized Milan, they used the room where the Last Supper is painted as an armory and then as a stable. Only an order from Napoleon himself stopped the damage. The refectory was walled up and then eventually reopened and subject to a number of inept restorations. During World War II, the painting was surrounded by sandbags and somehow barely survived an Allied bomb that directly hit the monastery. The most recent restoration took 21 years and was finished in 1999. It has proved to be very controversial with art historians, many of whom think the restorers took way too many liberties with Leonardo's work. I just note that I saw this painting in person for the first time in the fall of 2019 during a visit to Milan. I am not expert enough to render judgment on the restoration, but I will say that the painting retains extraordinary emotional and artistic power. In my next video, I'll move on to our next superstar, Michelangelo, another extraordinarily versatile talent who got bossed around by his patron, this time Pope Julius II. But first, I'd like to note that The Last Supper has become a cultural icon, and some of the results have been a little weird. Did The Last Supper really sell jeans? May the force be with you.